Hello and welcome to the Percussion Repair and Restoration Department at Aeolian Strings. Today we're going to restring a xylophone. Uh, it seems appropriate that since I work at a place called Aeolian Strings, I should periodically do some kind of a job that involves string. So that's what we're going to do today. So the first step is you need to assess whether the xylophone actually needs to be restrung or not. So you can actually see here that uh, this string is just about ready to completely come apart right there. So we definitely need to restring the accidentals. Now the accidentals are on one string and the naturals are on another string. So we'll have a look at the naturals here and you can see that basically between every single key it's wearing out quite a bit over here. You can see signs where the actual outer layer of the cord is coming off and you can see the inner layer. So we're definitely going to need to restring this instrument and um, we're going to go through all the different steps of how we're going to do that today. Alright, so here's what you're going to need in order to do this job that we got to do. You're going to want a vice grip, preferably one with a really long nose on it uh, so that you can grab a couple of strings at once and I'll show you about that later. You're going to want some sort of a blade or a set of scissors or a set of side cutters, which is what I'm going to use for this, side cutters. You're going to want a marker with a fairly thick felt tip on it, like a sharpie or something like that. You're going to want a lighter or a torch, some sort of a source of fire. A cleaning rag, uh, doesn't have to be particularly nice or fancy or clean even, we're just going to be using it to get rid of dust and dirt. And um, some sort of a long pointy object, I'm going to use a little wood screw in order to dig some of the old cord out of the spring hooks and we'll show you how to do that. And of course you need string. So for the string, you'll find that even if you are replacing, like regardless of which brand you're replacing the string on, uh, regardless of whether it's a Yamaha or an Adams or a Musser or whatever, Musser string works really, really well. Um, it's got the right material on the inside and it has the nice waxed coating on the outside and it's quite a bit less expensive than any other string. In particular, a Yamaha string is about twice as expensive as a Musser string. You're always going to get more than enough string when you buy Musser string. You just need to make sure that you buy it for the right instruments. So, for example, we're doing a three and a half octave xylophone today. You'll want to get string for a three and a half octave xylophone. If you're doing a four and a third octave marimba, make sure you get string for a four and a third octave marimba. If you're doing a vibraphone, make sure that you get string for either a three octave vibraphone or a three octave vibraphone with graduated bar width. But um, yeah, the packaging for the string isn't particularly fancy. It's just a Ziploc bag that it comes in with a model number on it. And for a three and a half octave xylophone, the model number happens to be E4441V. And uh, the, the other nice thing about the Musser string is that the end of it, you can see that the end of it is actually a little bit darker and it's rigid. So that's going to help us feed and weave the string through all the little holes in the keys that we have to get it through. It's going to make it a lot easier to do that and there's a lot of extra length, so that's what you're going to need for this job. Okay, so we need to take the accidentals off first and take the naturals off second, and then uh, when we're reinstalling, we in reinstall the naturals first and the accidentals second, uh, because the accidentals overlap the naturals, as you can see. So, when we take the accidentals off, um, Often you can actually, like if the string is in good shape and you're taking the instrument apart to travel somewhere and you want to roll up the keys, you can often pick up the entire set of keys by just like unhooking the string here and unhooking the string here, just like pick it up and carry it. But because this string is really close to coming apart, we don't want to do that because if the string breaks, all the keys will slip right off of the string and hit the floor. These keys are synthetic, so they might survive such a catastrophe, but uh, rosewood keys will not survive such a catastrophe. So, uh, with the accidentals, uh, some xylophones actually have these little spacers here. And you can see that this xylophone's missing, I think, two of them, yeah. Missing one here and missing one here. But these spacers are otherwise there. They're not actually really necessary. It's no big deal that they're missing. The only reason why they're there is so that if somebody's trying to put the xylophone back together and doesn't actually know the way it's laid out, like doesn't understand, the layout of the western keyboard and they don't know that there's supposed to be a gap here and a gap here and a gap here and a gap here or they don't know you know which notes are what so that's why those spaces are there so it's not a huge deal but we'll definitely hang on to them and then also these spring hook things here we're going to need to hang on to those as well so in any case because we're taking off um, because we're not going to lift the keys up by the string what we're going to do is we're going to cut the string there 
and we'll set this part off to the side. And then gradually what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull the string out and each time I pull the string out of a key I'm just going to make sure that it sits down nicely on the wood so it's not slamming down onto the wood. And I'm collecting these spacers as I go by. Collect the spacer, pull the string, being careful about each key as the string comes out of it. Set the spacer off to the side, pull the string. You do have to be much more careful and do this a lot more slowly if you're doing it with rosewood keys. But these are synthetic keys. This is a Musser instrument, so it's perfect that we got Musser string for it. But um, the keys are made out of a fiberglass based synthetic material called Kalon and uh, so they're a little bit more robust and durable and this one doesn't even have a spacer so I don't have to worry about it um, this is also a really good time to assess the health of your nodes and the nodes are these little things between the keys. They should have some rubber around them so that the key doesn't actually end up just rattling metal on metal. Also sometimes the notes get bent, particularly the uh, nodes at the end here if something slams into the key. It'll bend the node so um, you can use like a vise with some soft jaws to fix up the nodes. Um, you know, bend them so that they're straight up and down and uh, it's a really good time to notice whether your nodes are not straight. When, you're, when you've pulled all the string apart, put all the string out of the instrument and pulled all the keys off of the instrument. And we are just about done here. Let's pull out this one last spacer and pull out the last bit of string. ready to get started with the accidental manual. Alrighty, so I'm going to carry my accidental keys over. Three, and then two, and then three, and then two, and then three, Two, and then three. Looks like I didn't leave myself quite enough space to work with. Slide these over. And we've got the accidentals, so now we also need to grab our spacers, and we'll just use as many as we have. I don't even know how to reorder these if you don't have them, but like I say, they're not an absolutely necessary thing. So if you're missing a couple of them, then one thing that you can do is you can stagger where you're putting them. So for example, we'll have a spacer there but not here, and then we'll have a spacer here but not there. So that there is at least one spacer in this gap and one spacer in this gap. And then we've got that together. And everything's in the right order. So now I've got my string, and as I said, the end of the string is rigid, so it's actually going to be fairly easy for me to feed the string through these keys and then through the spacer and then through these keys. You just have to pull them apart to make sure that you're getting through each key. So obviously when you just sort of casually set the keys down on the counter you're never actually completely sure that the holes are going to line up perfectly for you. So I'm just feeding through all the keys and all the spacers. Every once in a while I try to give myself a whole bunch of extra slack and make sure that my cable isn't tangled up and also make sure that I'm not getting any twists or ugly turns into the cable because I don't want the cable to get trained to have an ugly twist or a turn in it because then that can get caught up in the middle of the instrument and then it can end up there permanently and it can make the new string more prone to breaking sooner then you'll have to do this all over again so just going all the way through here 
And finally, I'm at the very end. And once I'm at the very end of the manual, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull all the way so that I've only got about an extra foot of slack here. And then I'm going to just take this end of the rope and do exactly the same thing all the way through that section. Sometimes after you cut your cord, um, you'll find that the cord is actually caught inside of the spring hook and you can't get it out. Even if you try to twist the cord around, sometimes that'll dislodge it, but in this particular case it doesn't. So I'm just going to take a wood screw and try to jam it out of there and see if there's some interesting reason why I can't get it out. And no, it was just really frayed um, and somebody cut the cord very, very short. That's part of the reason why when I reinstall, I leave uh, extra length at the end. So anyway, it's one little procedural thing that you might run across. Unstringing the naturals works a little bit differently because unlike with the accidentals where you had those little spaces where you could reach in and pull because you actually had gaps between the keys, you don't have these gaps here. You try to yank from this side, you actually can't get it out at all. So what I'm just gonna do is lift up a few keys at a time and pull. And then lift up a few keys and pull. Lift up a few keys and pull. It makes it a lot easier to do. And then obviously we're setting the keys back down relatively gently. And just give the nodes a quick eyeball examination as you go along. And you can obviously look at them even more closely once you get the keys all the way off of the instrument. And then we might actually be able to pull all the way through the other end. I just want to do it slowly. to carry our keys over to our workbench area where we're going to restring them up. All right, so while we've got the instrument apart, we can go through and just wipe out all this dust here. It's a good opportunity to do that. And as I'm going down, I'm just expecting, or sorry, inspecting the, um, each node here to make sure that it works okay and uh, it's going to have some sort of insulation around it. You can actually order uh, the rubber part to go around the node if it's missing the rubber part altogether. You can get it from an instrument, or sorry, from a company called Century Mallet Instruments based in um, Chicago, Illinois, uh, but they're pretty expensive. So you can also just make your own out of electrical tape if you want. So I'm just going through and making sure that everything is nice and clean. And then another thing that I'm going to do while I've got everything apart anyway, is I'm going to check out the resonators. And you can see, if you look down the resonators, especially these ones, there's lots of, uh, lots of dust and dirt in there. It's nice to get it out of there. It doesn't really affect the sound of the instrument, which is nice to have an instrument that's not absolutely filthy. So this particular instrument, you just take off the low end of the resonators and because it's got this thing here, you have to bring it over and then lower it down. And then you can just dump it out. Yeah, look at all that stuff coming out of there. Awesome. That's why I don't wear nice pants or shoes when I do this job. You never know what you're gonna find with some of these instruments. This one doesn't have a metal bar across the top so you can just take it right out of the top. And just put that right back in there. Okay, so now that we've got our string all the way through the naturals, we're gonna put the naturals on first, as I said earlier. Um, we have nice new string and it's very strong so we can actually grab by this end here and we can grab these two strings at once over here and we can pick up the whole thing which is very heavy 
Um, synthetic wires are heavier than rosary bars often. I'm just going to set it in there. You see I'm kind of trying to estimate where it's going to line up here if you want to look in here. So as I was picking it up, I was kind of picking it up and I was trying to estimate that I would have just enough slack to be able to hook those two around there and then I can set this key into place and then this one into place, this one into place, this one into place. I'm actually going to run out of room and I'm going to have to go down to the other end and I'm going to have to set this key into place and then this one and the next one and the next one, 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 next one. All right. I got all my keys ready to go. So as you can see, I have about the equivalent, same amount of slack on either end. And this is what I mean by how they give you way, way, way more cord than you need. So um, because it's actually, it's super high quality stuff, what I'm going to do, since I don't actually need that much extra, is I'm going to pull one of them through until I only have about as much slack as I need at that end over there. So like that's enough slack, for example. Maybe I'll give myself a little bit more than that. And then I've got all this extra, so I'm going to pull this way, hook this back into place the way I just did earlier. I'm going to pull this way, so that when I end up cutting my rope, now I've got all this extra slack here, and I can use that for something else. Anything else you want to use it for, you can use it for uh, variety of things. You could probably even use it to string up a small djembe if you wanted to. But uh, in any case, now I've looked around here so I'm going to grab two of my spring thingies here and I'm going to grab a vice grip and I'm going to come down to the low end of the instrument and essentially what I need to do is I need to um, I need to pull just going to set these down for a second I need to pull the cord. The cord will stretch a little bit. So I'm going to pull the cord and then I'm going to put it together so that it's fairly tight. I'm going to hold it in place with my hand and then I'm going to open up the vice grip and clamp down on it so that I know roughly where I'm going to want these to hook together and you can see that because this spring is tapered when you actually feed the string through the way that you keep the string taut at the end of it so that this is pulling and so that this hooks the strings together is you actually tie a knot in the string. So what I'm going to need to do next is go and get my marker and I'm just going to set the spring hooks down here I'm going to grab one of them and I'm going to line it up so that the end of the hook is right in the middle of the jaws of the vise. And then I'm going to mark, see that's where the tapered end of the spring is going to end up being, but I'm going to mark about three quarters of an inch back from there so that I know to tie my knot just ahead of that marking. And then I'm going to grab the other spring hook. They're the same as each other, but I'll grab the other one and I will line that hook up in the center of the vise jaw again and mark three quarters of an inch back just like there. So that I know where to tie my knot. And now that I've done that, I will release the vise if I can manage it. There we go. And I will slide my spring hook on, which I have to do before I tie my knot. So I'm going to slide it all the way on so that I can tie my knot north of it. Slide it all the way down to the low F and I'll just find my mark and I'll just tie my knot. So I'm just making a loop, just a normal loop. And I'm going to push the string through it and pull it all the way through. And then I'm just going to make sure that my knot is where I wanted it, so I'll haul it up or down just a little bit, making sure that the knot starts just ahead of my mark. And there it is. I think I'm pretty happy with that. 
And uh, so I'll get rid of my slack there. And now I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. I'm going to slide the spring hook all the way on. There's my mark right there. So I'm going to just make a little loop. And I'm going to pull the string through that loop. Check where my mark is, slide the knot down so that it's nice and close to the mark. And now it's just above the mark. And I'm going to leave knots fairly loose in the end. I'm not going to really tighten them a lot right now because I'm not absolutely sure that they're exactly where they're ultimately going to have to be. You do need the knots to be tight enough that they will fit into the spring hooks, as you can see, though. They do actually have to fit in and slide all the way down to where the spring is tapered. So I'm just going to pull like that, tighten the other one a little bit, stuff it in there. And then I'm going to hook them together. And it seems as though I made my marks at a pretty good place because now I'm just going to hook the string around the end posts. And the string is nice and tight. You can see that as I'm actually pulling on the string, I'm pulling on the springs themselves. You may need to move the knots further up the string down the road as the string will still stretch over time. Now I've got this excess here, so I can just grab my side cutters and I can cut that excess. I'm going to leave a little bit more slack than the last installer left uh, so that I'll be able to dig it out later if I need to, but I'll try to cut them. And um, <laughs> sometimes it works better to get one at a time. So there's one. There's the other one. And of course, because it's a waxed coating around a cloth string, if you want to make sure that the end of it doesn't fray and come apart, you can um, burn it so that it melts together. And we have finished our natural manual. So here we are with our accidentals, uh, which we restrung first, but which we have to install last because we took them off first and we have to put them on last. Uh, you can see that I've preemptively left uh, only as much slack as we need on one of them, but I've left lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of slack on the other one. We can cut off and use for something else. So I'm going to grab it by here and by here, and I'm going to take it over to the xylophone. Try not to trip on the slack of the cord as I go, because that would suck. Obviously, so I'm trying to estimate where I'll hook in at the end just like that and just gently setting the rest of it down. And now I'm going to start putting them into place. So obviously you need to know what notes your xylophone has so that you know where you're putting them back to. Uh, and these spacers help with that. But um, this xylophone, the lowest note is an F natural, so that's an F sharp, which means that we're going to have three, then a gap, then two, then a gap, then three. And then a gap, and then two, and then a gap, and then three. And you can see I'm just moving the spacers over so that nothing's sitting up high. We don't have a key sitting up high on a node. We don't have a spacer sitting up high on a node. But everything's just nice and in there. We have a gap, and then two keys, and then we have a gap, and then three keys. And so you can see this procedure that we did earlier. Again, I'm just going to yank down so that the cord is nice and tight and I'm going to hold it together. I'm going to grab my vise and I'm going to grip onto both ends of the cord just like that. And then I'm going to take my spring hooks. They're identical to one another so I'm just going to use the same one. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this here in the middle of the jaw and then mark three quarters of an inch back from the end just the way I did. And then I'll put this one here with a hook in the middle of the jaw and I'll mark three quarters of the way back just like I did before. And I'm going to end up tying knots on this just like I did on the accidentals. Okay, so I've got my knots tied here and I'm just going to slide those knots down into the spring. Slide the knot down into the spring and then I'm going to pull nice and tight and I'll probably grab my cutters cut off 
this slack that we don't need and cut off this slack that we don't need and then I'll grab my fire burn the end so it doesn't fray same with the other one I'd recommend trying to avoid breathing that in by the way it's not very good for you and looks like I got enough tension there as well Pretty good. Thanks for watching. Take care.